bottles. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm bringing my water bottle. Let the record reflect. We've reconvened with all members present. Please rise. And Girl Scouts, please come on in. Ladies. <laughs> Today is, or this week is local government week, as you'll hear shortly. So we, to bring this to uh, our future leaders, we have invited some scouts to lead the uh, pledge. I want to come right up, right up here, front and center here. All right, the floor is yours. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay. Welcome, everyone. If you, uh, there is no uh, minutes for approval, so right to uh, greetings. And first uh, point of order, I'm going to keep my jacket on through the greeting, but I will probably take my jacket off as we are in this transition season. A little warm in here, so anyone in here, don't be bashful. If you start uh, melting, you can take off your jacket. Um, <laughs> Couple things going on. Uh, this past uh, last Wednesday, had a meeting with uh, leadership from PSE&G to review their gas line uh, plan and to make sure it was in sync with our capital plan. As you've noticed over the last couple of years, sometimes it's been scrambling trying to have things in coordination because we certainly don't want to pave a street and have them dig it up. And um, they can, uh, if they time it with us, they are much more prudent with their, uh, the money they get from their ratepayers. So the meeting was very productive and we, we all have a higher confidence in their, that their projects will not conflict with our capital plan. And of course, emergencies still can arise and so just because a road is newly paved doesn't mean everything underground is going to be strong or hold together. Uh, a couple of proclamations that, uh, or a proclamation I did this past uh, April 4th, went to Drew University, um, where they um, want to recognize Sexual Assault Awareness Day. And so that was uh, working with National Arts Movement called Force, Upsetting Rape Culture, and bringing stories of survivors that no one is alone. So we uh, declared that April 4th, 2019 shall be known and designated and set aside as Sexual, sexual Assault Awareness Day in Madison. This past Friday, I was in Trenton uh, for the annual Mayor's Legislative Day. And it's an opportunity for uh, mayors across the state to uh, hear and, and talk to the governor's, uh, governor's cabinet members as well as some of our legislators. And it's an opportunity for me to deliver my annual plea for liquor license reform. And now, I, since I did this, um, I've now found myself on the uh, task force to work with the uh, <laughs> League of Municipalities and the state legislature, hopefully, that we will see liquor license reform. Um, and then yesterday, I attended a celebration for Reverend Teresa Rushton, the pastor of the Bethel AME Church. She is retiring after 24 years in the ministry, and more importantly, 18 years as pastor of Beth Bethel AME Church. Um, her call to the ministry started at Drew University as a uh, theological student, and uh, she certainly has really represented uh, the church very well. We will miss her very much, and I declared yesterday, April 7th, as Reverend Rushton Day in Madison. So if you happen to see her before, she heads off to retirement. Please thank her for her, her role here. And the employee of the month for April is Pat Gallagher of the Electric Utility for her support during the transition of new electric utility superintendent, as well as working on solar accounts and her professionalism in dealing with residents. A lot of things going on there. So we appreciate Pat's uh, work. And if you see her, please congratulate her. And we come down and we're going to do a couple of proclamations and then also a... Uh,
a swearing in of a uh, volunteer firefighter too. I'm going to put our scouts on the um, spot again. We want to, our Girl Scouts, come back on up here again. So we invited the scouts because, as I mentioned, this is national or New Jersey local government. Don't be bashful. <laughs> You're the future leaders here. Step right on, right on up here. So the first time ever the uh, League of Municipalities has put together N New Jersey Local Government Week. And part of it is to educate everyone on the importance of local government, and especially re reaching out to our future leaders. And so that's why you're here. And since there's no one officially to uh, accept this proclamation, I'm going to put you on the spot and read it to you, and you can pretend to accept it for all in Madison. <laughs> for those that um, have not been, been to meetings uh, before, I'm very good at putting people on the spot. So, whereas local government is the government closest to most citizens and the one with the most direct daily impact upon its residents, and whereas local government provides services and programs that enhance the quality of life for residents, making their municipality their home, and whereas local government is administered for and by the citizens and it's dependent upon public commitment to and understanding its many responsibilities, and whereas Local government officials and employees share the responsibility to pass along the understanding of public service and their benefits. And whereas New Jersey Local Government Week offers an important opportunity for elected officials and local government staff to spread the word to all citizens of New Jersey that they can shape and influence this branch of the government. And whereas New Jersey State League of Municipalities and its member municipalities have joined together to teach citizens about municipal government through a variety of activities. Those activities include posting from our um, elected officials why they got involved in local government. We're having coffees this week. We had one this morning. And Wednesday will be at 8 a.m. at Madison Bagel. Anyone wants to come and join us and sit down with elected officials, there'll be no more than three there, so we don't have a quorum. And on Friday at Main Street Subs, so you can reach out. But of course, being part of local government means when we're walking down Main Street, we're all ears. And let me get right back to closing this out. And therefore, I, Robert H. Conley, the mayor of Borough of Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby proclaim the week of April 7th to the 13th as New Jersey Local Government Week and encourage all citizens, government officials, and employees to participate in events that recognize and celebrate New Jersey Local Government Week and encourage educational partnerships between local government and the schools as well as civic groups and other organizations. So thank you for coming to join us to emphasize the importance of local government. So now a little photo op, you'll look right there and the... <laughs> I'll let you take this back to your troop to uh, share with the rest of the crew. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Someone might have snuck up and hit the mute button on me. <laughs> Take a little hint. <laughs> Representative of the Thursday Morning Club, please come forward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a proclamation for Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. And April 5th is CASA Child Advocacy Day. Whereas we all have responsibilities, individuals, neighbors, community members, and citizens of Madison to help create a healthy, nurturing, safe experiences for children. And whereas healthy and safe childhoods help 
produce confident and successful adults, and whereas child abuse and neglect often occur when people find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and do not know how to cope, and whereas incidents of child abuse and neglect can be reduced by making sure all families have the support they need and deserve to raise their children in a healthy environment, and whereas court-appointed Special Advocates, CASA, is authorized by state statute and federal law to help the court and child welfare systems make the best interest decisions on behalf of children removed from home because of abuse and or neglect. And whereas CASA volunteer advocates in Madison help ensure that abused and neglected children who are placed in foster care and other out-of-home placements are safe and receive the services they need to achieve well-being. And whereas CASA advocates reduce the number of moves between placements and help shorten the overall time a child remi remains in placement and serve as a consistent person in the child's life until that child achieves permanency in a safe home with a loving family. Now, therefore, I, Robert H. Conley, the Mayor of Borough Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby proclaim April 2019 as Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month in Madison, and April 5th as CASA Child Advocacy Day 2019, urge all residents to support the CASA network across New Jersey as it strengthens families and helps children learn, grow, and thrive. Thank you for all the work you do for the children and your advocacy. Would someone like to say a few words? I would just like to thank you on behalf of the Thursday Morning Club and uh, on behalf of the of CASA of Morris and Sussex that we work with directly and to tell you that this has been a real privilege for us to work with this organization. And I'm very happy to tell you that of the several hundred children in Morris County who are in the foster care system, CASA of Morris and Sussex has been successful in assigning them each their own CASA volunteer. So this is a big accomplishment for them and we're very proud to be associated with this wonderful organization. They are one of 950 community-based organizations in the country that train, supervise, and, and volunteers to work with troubled and displaced teens and children, neglected teens and children. So it is, and, and it's a very, very uh, worthwhile endeavor. So I want to thank you very much for issuing this proclamation and raising the awareness and prevention of child abuse in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have representatives of the Kirby Center. Please come forward. And this is a proclamation recognized in the Week of the Young Child, April 8th through the 12th, 2019. Whereas the Week of the Young Child was first established in 1971, recognizing that early childhood years lay, lay the foundation for children's success in school and later life. And whereas the purpose of the Week of the Young Child is to focus on public attention on the needs of young children and their families to recognize early childhood programs and services that meet their, those needs. And whereas, the FM Kirby Children's Center, the Northwest Chapter of New Jersey Association for Education of Young Children, and other local organizations in conjunction, in conjunction with the National Association of Education of Young Children are celebrating the Week of the Young Child. And whereas these organizations are working to improve early learning opportunities, including early literacy, that can provide program, uh, a foundation of learning for young children. And whereas teachers and others who make a difference in the lives of young children in the borough of Madison deserve thanks and recognition. And whereas public policies that support early learning for all young children are crucial to young ch children's futures. Now, I ver therefore I, Robert H. Conley, Mayor of Borough of Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby proclaim April 8th through the 12th, 2019, is a week of the young child encourage all citizens to, to work to make a good investment in early childhood in our community. So thank you for your work. And On behalf of the FM Kirby Children's Center, we want to say thank you. And you very eloquently put everything down for us as to why this week should happen. So we thank you and we thank everyone here who gives support for early childhood education and the week of the young child. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Chief, we got both, okay. We have a couple of volunteers to, uh, for the oath of office, if they, let me have Thomas Johnson up here along with the Chief and uh, whoever is, wants, needs to be here with Thomas. Would you like me to take the picture? Thomas, raise your right hand and place your left hand on the Bible and repeat after me. I state your name. Thomas Johansson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform. And justly perform. All the duties of. All the duties of. Volunteer firefighter Madison Hook and Ladder Company number one. Volunteer firefighter Madison. Hook and, ladder Hook and Ladder Company number one. <laughs> According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I further solemnly swear. I further solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. And will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. To the same. To the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you for stepping forward to volunteer for Madison. Congratulations. May I have Santiago, Santiago Lopez please come forward with family. understand this has been a very special uh, time for you just becoming a US citizen and here here you are living up to the inspiration so congratulations so repeat after me I state your name Santiago Lopez you solemnly swear you solemnly swear that will faithfully that I will faithfully, impartially, impartially, and justly, and justly, perform all the duties, perform all the duties, a volunteer firefighter, a volunteer firefighter, Madison Hose Company number one, Madison Hose Company number one, according to the best of my ability, according to the best of my abilities, I further solemnly swear, I further solemnly swear, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey, and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey, and I will bear two faithful allegiance. And will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, to the same, and to the governments established, to the government established in the United States, in the United States, in this state, in this state, the, under the authority of people, on the authority of people. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you for stepping forward. Okay, one last announcement before I go on to reports from committees. Uh, one other thing as part of the local government week is um, this Thursday we have a, um, 
a mock council session scheduled. So any uh, students that might want to participate in a mock session, you can go out to Rosenet to sign up, and it's 5 o'clock on Thursday, and space is still available. So uh, check that out, and you'll see how government uh, works, and you'll get to pass a law. And on to reports from committees, public safety, M <laughs> Council President Bailey. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She was talking was to me. Talking. <laughs> okay. From the fire department. Uh, first off, I want to say congratulations to our two new volunteer uh, firefighters and congratulations to Evan Webb. We'll be um, supporting him in a resolution to be a career uh, firefighter tonight. And during the month of March, the fire department responded to 24 general alarms, 20 still alarms, 35 investigations, 29 medical calls, for a total of 108 calls for the month of March. The fire department also participated in every 15 minutes program that was held a couple of weeks ago at Madison High School. And on February 3rd, 2019, Doug Hom passed away. Doug was a volunteer member of the fire department from 59 1959 until 1986, 27 years, and when he retired as an engineer in the tool and dye industry and moved to Maine. He was a World War II veteran. Doug served in the Navy as a navigator aboard the US, USS Charles S. Perry, and he was 94 when he passed. And from the police department, the police department would once again like to alert residents to one ring phone scam automated phone numbers intentionally ringing one time repeatedly and frequently at random intervals, which is continuing in this area. The scam attempts to have the individual call the number back, at which time they keep the caller on the phone and route the call through premium domestic and international numbers resulting in hefty charges. Residents are also reminded never to give, an out, give out personal information, are urged to block these callers, refrain from answering unexpected calls from unknown international or unusual numbers, and returning calls from unknown or suspicious numbers. If you have fallen victim to the scam resulting in monetary loss, please contact our Madison Police Department at 973-593-3000. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Community Finance Borough Clerk, Ms. Vitale. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Chief Financial Officer submitted the budget to the State of New Jersey on Thursday, March 28th. This year, the bu borough budget is under state review, which happens every third year. Additional information is submitted to the state, including certifications and copies of shared service contracts. The budget hearing is scheduled for April 22nd. The budget document is posted online at the library and in the clerk's office in Hartley Dodge. Residents are also can also visit the annual budget process page on Rosenet for additional information. The chief financial officer is currently compiling information for the user-friendly budget. As per state guidelines, that document will be presented to council during the 2019 budget hearing. The finance department his work is also working on the Department of Energy EIA-8861 report. This document is submitted annually and details the operations of the electric utility, including outage information, number of customers, and costs. Next Monday, April 15th, is a busy day for everybody, but it's very busy in the finance department as well. The staff will be wiring $3.5 million to the Board of Education. On April 15th, the borough will also make the semi-annual debt payment on the bonds that fund it, the new public safety building, fire truck, and renovations at Hartley Dodge Memorial. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Utilities, Mr. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First on the electric department, at the end of the day on Friday, March 29th, the electric department became aware of a problem with cutout boxes that need a repair on Prospect Street. Replacing those boxes required an interruption of electrical service. But rather than interrupting the service during the day, a four-man crew came in at 4 a.m. on Saturday morning to make the repairs, and they were complete before 8 a.m. Did a great job with minimal disruption to our customers. Uh, and next, our electrical work at the Atlantic Healthcare Building at Geralda Farms has been completed. From the water utility, uh, the contractor has completed the installation of a new 8-inch water main from West End to 7-0 Circle. Service connections from the new main line to homes 
between John Marshall Lane and West Avenue are now complete. Uh, they still need to do the intersection connections uh, for John Marshall Lane, Overhill, and Hunter Drive, Seven Oak Circle, and Lorraine Ro La Road. They'll all be scheduled very shortly. Uh, these connections will interrupt service for homeowners on these streets. But there will be 24-hour notice to you, John, before this happens. <laughs> we only interrupt service without prior notification in an emergency. Um, and finally, the department coordinated with the Madison Pool in turning the water on. And so you know what this means. Summer is just around the corner. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Byrne. Well, as the oldest Girl Scout in the room, I would, um, I'd like to point out that organizations like Girl Scouts and Girl Guides and, and Boy Scouts uh, create the leaders for the future. I mean, one of the first things you ever hear out of a politician's mouth is whether or not they were an Eagle Scout or a Silver Award. But I'd also like you to, to look around at yourselves because everybody here, with the example of a handful, are volunteers. We're not paying you to be here, but you came anyway, and you're going to be part of our uh, decision making, and, and that's the way it should be. So you're talking about spring, uh, if you are Ken O'Brien or Bob Vogel, your, your thoughts turn to playing fields and road construction. Uh, the road improvement uh, bid was successfully bid on 328, and uh, so you can accept, you can anticipate uh, road construction to start soon. Um, this will be mostly arterial um, streets, uh, so it should be better getting around a uh, town this year than it was last summer. Uh, well, A and B will be, AB will be operational by Friday. Um, An historic qualification for Hartley Dodge has gone out. Uh, that's anticipating um, renovating the East Wing. And we are moving towards an improved DPW recycling center. So uh, it will be cleaner and more contained. Um, I'm not going to steal a lot of thunder from Claire Whittacombe, who is here to give us a presentation, but I will say that the Madison Environmental Commission has um, been working very, very hard on helping us um, reduce our use of uh, plastic. You know, I, you, I don't know if you saw in the papers last week, but a a whale washed up on the shore. It had almost 50 pounds of plastic inside it. And now we're finding out that plastic might be in this water. So um, it, it may seem like a small gesture here in Madison, but it's part of a much, much larger um, issue. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, community affairs, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, the next meeting is this coming Thursday, April 11th, at 2 p.m. in the Senior Center. Everybody's invited. It's an open public meeting. Uh, the May meeting is planned to be held at Rexford Tucker Senior Housing on May 8th from 3 o'clock to 4.30 p.m. Again, you're all invited to attend. In the Senior Center, there are some important dates to keep in mind. Thursday, April 11th, uh, the Baggett movie presented by the Environmental Commission, excuse me. <clears throat> Wednesday, April 17th, the annual Volunteer Spring Luncheon is being held. Thursday, April 25th, ah, trivia is now located at 15 Sato Thierry. The winner gets a prize. There are less than 20 seats available for Beautiful by Carol King at $75 a piece, so please sign up. Residents who may need a ride around Madison can call the Civic Center at 973-593-3095 to use our free van service. Drivers schedule the daily rides from 8.30 a.m. to uh, from 8.30 to 9.30 on Monday through Friday. The Director of Business Development and Downtown Development Commission, the next DDC meeting is planned for Thursday, April 18th, 7.15. Again, everybody's invited. May Day is scheduled for Saturday, May 4th. Please come out and help beautify the city. The Madison Into Yellow 2019 will kick off on May Day and conclude on May 11th with a community picnic. More information is available at intoyellow.com slash Madison. The DDC is planning a new event to be called the Rose City Summerfest. It's scheduled for June 15th and is on tonight's consent agenda. The Madison Farmer's Market will return to Central Avenue between Cook Avenue and Main Street 
and will run from Thursday, May 23rd through October 24th. The hours are 2 to 7. Chamber of Commerce, updates to the Madison Loyal Cards are available at the, be at the beginning of the month. Upcoming events, uh, the monthly networking breakfast is tomorrow, April 9th at 7.45 a.m. The Easter Fun Fest is scheduled for Saturday, April 13th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And that's on Waverly Place, and there will be prizes. Uh, the Ladies' Night is Thursday, May 9th, and the annual awards dinner for the Chamber is Tuesday, June 4th at the Brook Lake Country Club. For the METC and MACA, the MACA board meeting is on April 11th at 9 a.m. in the Community Arts Center at Rose Hall. This month, the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts is celebrating its 50th anniversary. It was founded in 1969 by Edgar and Agnes Land. METC has become one of New Jersey's premier history museums, focusing on the early life of the people of New Jersey. Supported by a strong endowment, government grants, and private donations, and sponsorships, METC is thrilled to announce the creation of a new permanent installation, working the land, life, family, and change in the early 1800s in New Jersey. And it will open at the end of April. This is the first permanent installation since 1997. The Recreation Advisory Committee continues to work on the field user fee proposal and hopes to present it to the council before the end of May. The spring season is officially underway. The weather and lack of available field space and lighting continue to pose challenges, but the Recreation Department is working in close collaboration with all of our sports groups, as well as Sean Dowling and the MHS Athletics, in order to maximize everyone's use of the turf fields at both MRC and Monica. The following fields are either shut down or being rested extensively in an effort to improve their respective conditions. The Rosedale Soccer Field, the Ice Rink Soccer Field, and Niles Park. The borough has contracted with True Green for weeding and fertilization across all the athletic fields. The Rec Department is currently evaluating additional avenues of repair and improvement. So far this year, the Rec Department has committed $27,300 worth of upgrades and improvements at our athletic facilities with several additional projects on the immediate horizon. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And health. Thank Who's you, Mayor. Going? Uh, Madison Health Department is sponsoring health screenings for both men and women. The women's health screening is Monday, April 29th, and the men's screening is Monday, May 6th. Please call for an appointment and further details. MASA is sponsoring mindful parenting classes and is looking for more registrants. Please email Lindsay DeStefano at DeStefanoL at Rosenet.org. Topics include mindful parenting, anxiety, and screen time. From the Public Health Nursing Department, specific information about recommendations for traveling with young infants and protection from measles has been posted on the, the website and Facebook. Madison Health Department has applied for the New Jersey Department of Health Influenza Honor Roll, which recognizes efforts in flu prevention and education. Springtime brings with it various concerns that homeowners should be aware of and take measures to address, including being conscientious about lawn and property maintenance, noise issues, and avoid feeding animals outdoors. The Pet Licensing Department is finalizing dog and cat licenses for 2019. Notifications were sent to advise registered pet owners of this annual responsibility. The staff would like to thank those who have graciously sent in the renewals and those who have paid their court fines. And the next Board of Health meeting is Tuesday, April 16th at 7.30, 28 Walnut Street, and is open to the public. Thank you. And just a reminder to all the guests that came here for the presentations at the beginning, you're always uh, welcome to stay and take in how uh, local government works, but if you uh, need to leave, we, we won't judge you. It's a judgment-free zone. So, uh, Moving on to communications and petitions. Yes, Mayor. Mayor and Council received 17 emails from uh, <laughs> April 4th through today um, regarding the proposed um, Shop ordinance. There we go. Okay. Thank you. And now we're on to the first of two invitations for discussion. This is one is limited to our either the two agenda items or the resolutions, which I will list shortly. The agenda discussions we have: the Kindness Garden presentation and the Environmental Commission Plastic Free Week. Um, those I know we have some people here related to uh, ordinance. The hearing on Ordinance 11. So there will be a hearing on Ordinance 11, but that ordinance will be withdrawn, and we anticipate that we will be listening to the comments and coming back at a later date with a revised ordinance. 
So, you, but you'll be able to comment on that at the hearing and not right now. The uh, resolutions that are part of our consent, 118, authorize an execution of settlement and release agreement. Uh, 119, which is a uh, awarding the contract to Joe Med Contracting the amount of $592,000 for the 2019 Road Improvement Program. This was funded through ordinances one and two, 2019. Resolution 120, approving temporary signs for Madison Education Foundation 16, 16th annual 5K race. The race is on May 5th, and the signs will be up from the April 15th through May 9th. 121 is ratifying the appointment of Matthew Keene and uh, Lucas McCory as unpaid interns for the Madison Fire Department. 122, approving Downtown Development Commission event on Saturday, June 15th, as Rose City Summerfest and authorizing a beer garden. 123, resolution approving uh, supporting Plastic Free Week in Borough of Madison, which you'll be hearing shortly about. That's from April 27th to May 4th. Resolution 124 is rejecting the sole bid for Community Place Reconstruction Project. This is funded through Community Development Block Grant, which requires at least two bid bidders. So that will go out, back out to bid. Resolution 125, authorizing Madison Chamber of Commerce sidewalk sales and merchant open house on Saturday, April 27th. And uh, resolution 126, approving uh, raff, raffle licenses for Madison Volunteer Ambulance Corps. Resolution 127, authorizing uh, raffle license for the PT, PTSO Madison High School. And 128, which is uh, authorizing um, application for the Thursday Morning Club raffle licenses. 129 is renewing a liquor license for 2018-2019 uh, term for uh, Cross Atlantic Vines. This is an inactive license currently. Resolution 130, which is uh, authorizing a shared service agreement with the health services for the Township of Springfield. Resolution 131, appointing Evan Webb, as was mentioned, report to the position of probationary firefighter. So, those are, so you can comment on any of those resolutions or the two agenda items. If you wish to comment on those, please step forward, state your name, your address, the agenda item you're talking about, and keep your, try to keep your comments to three minutes or less. You do get a one minute grace period. I will cut you off at four minutes. Anyone else, anyone wishing to comment, please step forward on those agenda items. Kathy, yep. Kathy Daly, West End Avenue. Um, just a quick question about resolution 130. And you don't have to answer it now, you can answer it when you're talking about it. Um, this is the Springfield Health Services Agreement. Um, is this a continuation or is it no? And um, if you could just uh, list the shared services, towns that we have shared services agreement with for health services, that would be appreciated too. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Or you want to uh, you can do that, sure. Yep. Uh, yes, Kathy, this is a continuation of a relationship with Springfield. We also have contracts with Cranford and uh, Chatham Township at the moment. Okay. So it's a total of three. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on resolutions or the two agenda items? Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting and we move on to our agenda discussions uh, and our Kindness Garden presentation. Really getting a chance to participate in local government. Um, I am Bethany Bradshaw. I'm from Troop 4538, and I'll be presenting the Kindness Garden. Okay. 
in the front. You can touch it up. I know we're in the fridge. While we're uh, working on our uh, audiovisual, um, just w w once again, for, uh, related to Ordinance 11, the ordinance, we will have the hearing as scheduled, but the ordinance will be withdrawn as it stands today, and we anticipate a new ordinance coming back after uh, the input from people tonight and also some more work from our legal team and our uh, volunteers. You might, you might also notice that every single member of the council has a, has a rock in front of them, and it's been, desic it's been, um, it's been painted, and then uh, really affirmations have been painted, have been painted on it. Mine says, "Shine bright." Okay, with with that, okay, now you're on. So, um, examples of the rocks from the kindness garden that the community members have been writing messages on. Um, so Madison, New Jersey Rocks had started in the summer of 2017. And this, this picture shows with the statue. Um, this statue is in Milwaukee, which shows that the rocks have traveled throughout a bunch of places. Um, this picture shows that um, one of our members from the rock group has placed their rock on a cruise that they went on and the captain had found it and they received an award. Um, as well as another one of our members goes on a daily walk and she updates us with the weather and rocks if she finds any. So a kindness garden is an area within a town with rocks with positive messages on them. Um, the idea really is to uh, be a place where you can reflect on your day, relax, really to be motivated and to be inspired, really. Um, so this project is for my silver award for Girl Scouts. Um, the award is something to better your community and to show that you are organized, determined, and a leader. Um, this shows the steps of a silver award. Um, as to where the garden is. The proposed location for it is in Cole Park, which is on the corner of Greenwood and Fairview Avenue. Um, I had checked with Council Member Carmela Vita um, Vitelli as of the location and the Superintendent of the Public Works Department, Ken O'Ryan. Um, so this is the area of where I was hoping the rocks could go. Um, it is in between two trees, um, and there's a bench in, underneath it. Um, it is opposite the fountain, so if you want to take a seat and just have a nice view. Um, this is one of the trees, and underneath it is some rocks that have been had messages on from the community. Um, this was done on Bottle Hill Day. And um, we've had a lot of rocks written, <laughs> really. Um, <laughs> um, this is an example. These are not 
a full amount of rocks. Um, so back to the bench. Um, it's really a shaded area where you can sit, just reflect, relax. And the sign um, in front of it is a concrete base we were hoping to write kindness rocks in front of. Um, this is the example. The word kindness is spelt out of glass nuggets. Um, it's obviously not going to be this close to the bench, so you can actually sit down. Um, these were also made by people from Bottle Hill Day, as after you wrote a message on the rock, you could glue a piece of glass to other pieces of glass. And then this was fired and smashed and then fired again. So they are smooth, round nuggets. And we're hoping to spell kindness rocks. Um, as for the bench, I was hoping that we could get um, the members of the commu community to have their handprints on the bench to show that we've built ourselves together and we are just really strong. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bethany and I met, I guess, last year with the mayor uh, when she proposed this. And we, we thought it, it was like um, something really, really good. And then I went on the website, Madison Rocks, and boy, they really rock. I mean, there's more people in this town that are doing it, and it, it's just a, an awesome, awesome thing. Um, we met with Ken, and Ken has been absolutely great. Um, you know, he will be working with Bethany uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, the proposed cement or whatever we're going to use uh, for that word kindness goes in properly. Um, they're, they're enthusiastic about maintaining it and whatever. I also uh, spoke, and I, I didn't get a chance to tell you this, uh, to Tom Salaki, who is the chair of the Parks Committee, and he wants to be involved, and he'll help with maintenance and whatever, and um, so, uh, you know, that, that's a good thing. Um, but we were, I was very, very surprised once I got into the website and realized that so many people and so many kids were so enthusiastic about it and finding, you know, some of the, the most beautiful rocks I've ever seen painted. So, you know, good luck. Good job. So we have any other questions for Bethany or any uh, comments? And then I will, would entertain a motion to endorse the project to, to move forward. All right. I'll move to endorse. Second. All in, any further discussion? <laughs> I was going to do a big thing. Oh, okay. Keep going. All, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Very excellent work. This is. <laughs> and very appropriate for local government week. This is how it works. Environmental Commission. Claire Whitcomb. I have some friends. Um, I'm very, very excited, really, really excited to be up here talking about Plastic Free Week in Madison. Uh, I was cleaning out my computer yesterday and I saw an email from 2014 that was sort of on this very same topic and uh, I didn't do it. There was volunteers involved. All I can say is it died like a leaky balloon, to use a plastic metaphor. So three things happened recently that I think made me realize that this is in the air. The first was that Chatham Township called up and said, would, would Madison be interested in joining a multi-town coalition to work on reducing single-use plastic in uh, Morris County? And the mayor said, go for it. So we've been meeting. Last Sunday, someone came from uh, Roselle Park. Like, the word is out. People are just coming. Secondly, um, Bridget Daly, who's sitting over there, showed up at uh, an environmental commission and said, why don't we work with Stop and Shop and uh, have like an Earth Day event and like give away uh, reusable bags. 
And then we went to the Green Vision Forum. And if you're on the Environmental Commission, you never know what's going to happen at the Green Vision Forum. It's all of Madison Schools plus Drew, and all the kids make presentations. And um, a lot of them were on plastic. A lot of them were on um, the impact of plastic on marine life and plastic bags. And so um, we were having a call, and we like came up with this idea for Plastic Free Week. And so we have seven actions that we're asking our community to take. And um, we are going to give out 100 reusable bags at Stop and Shop to kick it off. And we've invited the kids from the Kings Road School who presented on plastic bags to man the table, along with um, volunteers who are not even from the Environmental Commission. It's just great. Um, and we have a very special team that came out of the Green Vision Forum. <laughs> Evans, who's a fifth grader at Tory, Tory J. And we have Carissa Finnerty and Christian Wang from uh, Project Aware at Madison High School. And they didn't know each other, but they both presented on straws. Well, the high school did many more things, but I said, meet, meet me afterwards. And so we've been meeting. And here you go, Amelia. <laughs> Um, so, uh, about plastic straws. Well, they're a big problem in the environment because many birds and fish and all the marine life eat them, and then they die because they have too much plastic in their systems. And birds sometimes eat them as well. And um, they're not recyclable, and like over 500 million straws are used every single day. And I just think that Plastic Free Week is a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, as a result of all of the negative things about straws and how they just negatively impact the environment, um, we were we were planning to do the Skip the Straw initiative, um, which uh, would encompass us um, trying to get businesses to voluntarily um, reduce the amount of straws they use in some way or another. Um, and there's like a broad way in which the, uh, the businesses can do this. Um, it can be as small as um, having requiring the customers to ask for a straw instead of just giving them out and having some people not even use them and then having to throw them out. Um, it can be as small as that to something like um, using reusable metal straws that you can just put in a dishwasher um, as opposed to having to throw out plastic um, one after another. Uh, so with Project Aware and Amelia, our plan is to go out to all of the, the Madison businesses and just get a general survey of the businesses that are um, willing to do it, the ones that support it, um, and I guess also the extent to which um, businesses would like to do it. Um, and so, so the businesses would reduce the amount of straws they use in some way and also have probably some sort of informative flyer or poster hung up um, just to show the, their customers um, who go there just why, why exactly they're doing it so that maybe it can open up their eyes to um, maybe themselves in their personal lives using less uh, straws for the aid of the environment. Thank you. I would like to say that this is happening on spring break, so the students are spending their spare time. So um, another volunteer showed up, uh, Kirsten Wallenstein, uh, who's a uh, Central Avenue School PTO president, and her, she was concerned about the amount of plastic waste at um, sporting events in Madison. So the initiative is not just to recycle, it's really to not use plastic to start out with. Um, use a reusable bottle, bring it in, take it out. Um, Ellen Cranefuss on the Environmental Commission uh, created this uh, resource of su sustainable uh, takeout supplies, and Lisa Ellis is sending it out to Bottle Hill Day vendors. And it's, it's a basic first step, and uh, it'd be great to eliminate styrofoam, but this is a great first step. Um, I mentioned that Stop and Shop's giving out 100 reusable bags, and we're doing outreach with the Senior Center. John mentioned that we're screening Bag It, um, the plastic bag movie that'll make you really sad, on April 11th. Maureen Byrne has already put her reusable, extra surplus reusable bags on the senior bus, which is so that 
you know, if you're being driven to stop and shop, you have no excuse not to have a, a really nice bag. So um, Ellen has an, also an idea for a reusable bag depot at the farmer's market. So we're on it. Uh, we have an online pledge um, that will be on RoseNet. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, that has the seven actions, and um, you can check which ones you want it do so that we can have an idea of like which is uh, most acceptable or wide, widely popular. Um, why does this matter? Because basically we're, in, with the advent of climate change, we're having a lot more flooding. We're having a lot more things go into the sewers and out into uh, our streams and rivers. And the, basically ocean waste starts in communities even like ours. Um, Plastic microparticles can even be found in the rural headwaters of the Raritan River. And uh, almost all New Jersey waters are contaminated. Um, we, the Madison Environmental Commission and ANJEC, which is the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, is hosting a single-use plastic pollution roundtable. We have eight towns that are co-sponsoring it. And uh, like towns from all over are, are and, Anyone can come, it's free, and we strongly, we would really, really love the support of the, of the town council to attend to understand what's being done, what, what, are, or what do ordinance look like, what would be right for Madison, if anything at all. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> council, any questions? And again, uh, I, I, I want to uh, commend everyone on your work on this. And as, uh, as, as I mentioned with our uh, resolution at our last meeting, that if we can just train people to ask before they give out that straw or throw that one item in a plastic bag or three items in a plastic bag, we'll, we would have uh, made a, an impact. So we have uh, resolution 123, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, supporting the Plastic Free Week in Borough of Madison, which hopefully leapfrogs into many Plastic Free week, free Weeks. Any other questions or comments? Okay, now we move on to uh, ordinances for hearing. Will the clerk please read the statement? The ordinances scheduled for hearing were introduced by title and passed on the first reading at the regular meeting of the council held on March the 25th, 2019, were posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public testing sink. Okay, call up uh, Ordinance 8, 2019. Calendar year 2019 ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank. I open the hearing for Ordinance 8. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. We have one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> please. Kathy, come on up. Uh, I, again, just another question. Kathy Daly, 20 West End Avenue. Just another question. Um, if you could, as you're talking through this, um, explain um, why the appropriation limits are being exceeded or why we're, why we're passing an ordinance to enable us to exceed the appropriation limits. And um, if it's related to the cost of living adjustment for 2019, um, if you could explain what that was and how much we're planning to exceed it by if we are planning to exceed it. Um, and that's, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll have a, when we uh, close the hearing, we'll have the CFO uh, explain that. Any other comments or questions on this ordinance? I close the hearing. I have a, a motion. Uh, Mayor, I move Ordinance 8-2019. Second. Okay. Or Jim, do you want to address that question? Uh, thank you, Mayor. It's a primarily a ministerial action that gives future councils flexibility should there be a need to increase the appropriations beyond what is permitted. It allows you to bank whatever appropriations you did not use, and by voting and saying instead of doing 2.5%, we're going to do 3.5%, it expands the amount that can be banked. Um, it is just flexibility. There's no obligation. What ends up happening is the appropriations that were banked three years ago roll off and the new appropriations come on. Thank you. Eric, any other? I guess just for clarification, Jim, so how much are the appropriations going up this year in a percent terms? Um, 
point seven. You know, I left that sheet over the chair there, Pat, but I'm going to point everyone who really wants to kind of dive into it. It's uh, sheet 3B2 of the state budget document that talks about the uh, expenditure cap calculation. And it goes through the entire calculation of how much was, um, how much were under the cap, how much uh, it is, it's $495,000 if it's a 2.5%, but if you vote tonight to expand it to 3.5%, that gives you 198021 in additional, so a total amount that can be banked this year of 395. Um, and the total amount that we're under the cap is 1.38 million. That's on sheet 3B2 if you're looking at it online. Pat. No, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking, I was looking for the budget. <laughs> okay. That's fine, thank you. Okay, any, any other comments or questions? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Cohen? Yes. I declare Ordinance 8, 2019 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there in newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 9-2019. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $310,000 from the General Capital <laughs> Improvement Fund for the 2019 Sanitary Sewer Program. I open hearing for Ordinance 9, 2019. Anyone wish to comment, please step forward. I forgot to make the statement before, but as we go for, through all these with a the hearing, please try to keep your comments to three minutes. I do give a one-minute grace period, but we'll cut you at four minutes. Anyone wish to comment? Please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Oh, Mayor, I move Ordinance 9-2019. Second. Any council discussion? Maureen? Yeah, I'd just like to point out that uh, we have been investing in our sanitary sewer program for a considerable number of years, and it has translated into savings um, at the uh, sewer treatment uh, facility that we share with Chatham. So and, uh, it has a very good return on investment. Thank you. Pat? But just to be clear, this money is for the transportation system in Madison, right. correct? Okay, thank you. Yep. Oh. But it uh, it does, if we keep things from getting in there, it saves okay. our costs yeah. at the other end, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So okay. Any other further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rupert? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. I declare Ordinance 9 2019 adopted and finally passed, and I ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 10 2019. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 195 of the Madison Borough Code Land Development Ordinance to amend Section 30.5b2 uh, requirements for accessory structures and uses. I open hearing for Ordinance 10. Anyone wish to comment? Please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 10 2019. Second. Any council discussion? <laughs> Roll call vote. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. I declare Ordinance 10 2019 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish no notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 11 2019. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending and supplementing Chapter 59 of the Borough Code prohibiting the retail sale of certain dogs and cats in the borough. Again, I open the hearing, but again, this will be uh, withdrawn. Anyone wishing to comment on this ordinance, please step forward. State your name, your address, and keep your comments to three minutes, or I will cut you at four minutes. Please step forward. Allison Deeb from Marstown. Uh, Good evening, Council and Mayor Conley. Thank you for uh, letting me speak tonight. Councilwoman uh, Vitale, thank you so much for taking my call today. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, and thank you for inviting me to come and just present to you what we found in Morristown. I should also say, for the record, I'm a Councilwoman in Morristown. I've had the honor and privilege of serving there for the past 12 years. Um, and. Uh, for a long time was the only Republican on the Morristown <laughs> Council. So uh, about two years ago, I worked with Council President Stephen Armington uh, on the other side of the aisle, and together 
we authored a three-page memo analyzing the legislation that you have up for consideration and adoption this evening. And we worked with several groups and we thoroughly analyzed the issue. And I just wanted to share with you tonight uh, that memo. It's dated October 2nd of 2017. Uh, we introduced legislation that you uh, have up for consideration tonight on May 9th uh, of 2017, and we tabled that legislation on July 27th, uh, 2017. And then in November, we issued this memo to the council, and it was distributed, distributed to all the council members, and it was on the council agenda. So this is a part of public record, and I will, I will submit it to you this evening for the clerk. Basically, after several meetings, uh, myself and Council President Armington felt that this legislation was not in the best interests of, of regular people, regular uh, pet owners, people that were seeking to buy a pet, simply because you were choosing one group over another. Um, we didn't fear, feel that it was, it was fair. We felt that it was discriminatory, discriminating against a business, discriminating against a pet store, telling a pet store what to do. Mainly, and for this reason primarily, is because rescue organizations are not regulated the way that shelters are regulated, animal shelters, and the way that, that um, pet, pet stores are regulated that sell live animals. So we felt today strongly in today's class Climate, when you have pet stores already under attack, trying to make a living, it's their livelihood. You have two wonderful pet stores here in Mars, Marstown, excuse me, in Madison, trying to make a living, being threatened by Chewy, um, by the online marketplace, that we just didn't feel by choosing one business model over another um, was the right way. Let the marketplace decide. Let the, let the prospective pet owner decide. If they want to buy from a, a breeder, great. If they want to buy a, one, one minute. a dog from a pet store, great. Um, but let, let them decide. Because there are already state and federal laws at work, and letting those laws do their job would be the best place, not for a municipality to, to do overarching regulation, because they simply couldn't enforce it. So um, in a nutshell, we felt that it was, it was inappropriate, um, that uh, pet shops were already struggling, that the rescue business was already highly unregulated, and it, was, it would be an unfair playing field. So lastly, I'll close with um, for this thought for you to consider. If this is being motivated by public health, and you might want to really consider this because if your motivation is to promote public health, that's actually something that you might be hurting by allowing retail rescue on the streets of Madison. Hi. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish, wish, wishing to be heard, please step forward. Jacqueline Cowan, um, former Madison resident, but I do have a business that's uh, partially in Madison. I own Flippin' Possum Dog Trading. And uh, the main issue that I have with this is how it affects, like, small, reputable breeders. Like, let's say you have a Madison resident who has their champion show dog. As soon as they breed that dog, the way it's right now, they become a kennel, and they can no longer sell puppies. That's taking an option away from people. I don't agree with selling dogs in pet stores. Rescue's fine, but it's not for everyone. I s see dogs all the time. Dogs come from rescues that have all sorts of issues. People should have the ability to go and get a puppy where they know what the tournament's going to be, exactly how it's going to grow up. And that's about it. Thank you. D did you write your uh, name? Oh. Yep. What are it? Should be a clipboard there somewhere. Oh, who's that? Allison, did you write your name? And no. Wait. I forgot to uh, remind anyone else wishing to be heard, please step forward. And now I'll remind everyone as you step forward to write, write your name and address on the clipboard.
Oh, I left two papers. Hi, my name is Martha Rosetto. I'm from 26 Chesterfield in Chester, New Jersey. I am a consumer. I come here as a consumer. The, about two years ago, I purchased two pets. They were they, two full-bred Maltese at a local pet store. And as soon as I got them, I had a lot of problems with them. They had a lot of health issues, and it was an emotional roller coaster. Had I known that there were other rescues, had I known of St. Hubert's, had I known of North Star, had I known of them, I would have gone there. I did not realize at that point, nor was I educated, we're told that if we, if we choose to go to a pet store, we can do that. But we're not educated. I was blindsided, and I'm, I'm angry for it. What I ended up doing was I kept Chetanel because they became part of my family. Through the years, they had health issues and did not last long. So what, if I had gone to St. Hubert's, they would, have, they would have paired me with a dog. They would have allowed me, if I had to, without a question, return that dog. If I had had the flexibility to do that with my two dogs, I would have done that. I did not realize at that time also that 90% of dogs do come from puppy mills. Any dog that you purchase from a pet store comes from a puppy mill. I was not aware of that. I have since educated my family. I have, been, I have told my brothers, my sisters, my family members, my friends of what occurs. I just want to share one short thing with you. A friend of mine came last year, and she always brings her granddaughter up to the pet store. And she's, you know, she says it's just wonderful. You know, they're in cages. They get showcased. They're, they're under the fluorescent lights. I have to do this. And, and, and it's a wonderful sure thing. Your comments to the council. Okay. The and it's a wonderful thing how they are showcased. And we, we share a relationship with that, my, she and her granddaughter. So I listened to her. I did not say anything because sometimes if you start blurting out things, people no longer listen. So I, I allowed her to talk. And she did do that. Then after she was done, then I did mention to her, perhaps you need to look at all of the, you lead, need to look at the Humane Society and everything that goes on there, and then make your judgment. I left her at that. She called, she left my home. She called me a week later, and she said, I am so embarrassed. I feel so bad that I did not know any of this stuff. From there forward, she has never brought her granddaughter to another pet store, nor has she advised any of her, any of her siblings or family members to do that. One quick thing. I, I am from the medical business, so we have a lot of regulations, and God forbid if we didn't have those, how things would go about. I find that the pet industry does not have that, and I'm not certain why. I am a consumer, and I'm not sure why. So I wish that we would pass this ordinance, have the power, bring it forward, allow everybody to, to with St. Hubert's and, and everyone here, why wouldn't we do something like that? It's an injustice to all our shelters. <coughs> Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard, please step forward. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Teresa Nicoletti and I'm from Clinton, New Jersey. I'm a customer from a pet shop and my parents purchased an English Bulldog and for the past three to four years that we've had her, she's been nothing but happy and healthy ever since. Most importantly, healthy with no medical issues since we brought her home. This is the United States of America <coughs> and we have choices and being that we've tried to adopt and rescue a dog, his behavioral issues questioned my parents as to whether he could be alone with my young <coughs> brothers and he could not. My parents couldn't put their children in a situation to be harmed by a dog we've tried to help. We came to the conclusion that a rescue was not a good fit for our family because we couldn't risk adopting a dog with potential behavioral or medical issues or trauma issues. So we came to a pet shop to purchase a puppy to not only have a healthy and happy dog, but a puppy to grow with me and my siblings. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard, please step forward. She didn't. Did you uh, record your name, the last uh, speaker? Yes. Okay, you did. Thank you. She didn't write her name. She didn't write her name. <laughs> we'll get her on the way. Janice Fisher, Manasquan, New Jersey. 
I coordinate the Puppy Mill Awareness Campaign for Friends of Animals United <coughs> New Jersey. And as an advocate, I've worked for 10 years on this. <coughs> I've worked on local, county, and statewide legislation, and I've worked with countless pet store customers who become victims of unscrupulous pet stores. Stores have taken advantage of customers in many ways, and certainly there are healthy puppies that have been sold, but there have been as many sick puppies and certainly inhumanely bred puppies that have been sold. Our research points to that. Not only have sick and inhumane puppies been sold, but these pet stores for the longest while had been using uh, what we call predatory financing which is nothing more than a subprime pet lease, which often targets customers with marginal credit. And if the idea of leasing a puppy isn't troubling enough, consider that the customer will have paid double the purchase price by the end of the lease. And if they defaulted on payment, that puppy could be reimbursed. The state has now, uh, they have legislation pending that would ban these leases. This, the coalition, coalition of responsible pet store owners is now uh, supporting that, but I believe they're supporting it only because the ASPCA has filed a high-profile lawsuit against a local pet store for using these leases and taking advantage of customers. For many years, if I can give you a little history, uh, pet stores refused to tell their customers where their puppies came from. Every member of the coalition of uh, responsible pet store owners strongly opposed that bill. So think about it. They didn't want the public to know where these puppies came from. And even after the law took effect, the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs fined 26 out of 29 pet stores for failure to comply with the law. In fact, some of the largest fines were assessed to some of the members of the Coalition of Responsible Pet Stores. My group and the Humane Society of the United States researched the breeders for every New Jersey pet store. And we found that pet stores had purchased puppies from breeders that were cited for, for violations of the Animal Welfare Act by the USDA. Violations that are prohibited in New Jersey and violations that would make their customers cringe if they knew the truth. Breeders had dogs with ear, eye, and skin infections, open wounds with flies biting them, lesions between their toes because of wire flooring, grade four dental disease, dogs and puppies. One, one minute. I'm sorry? One minute. Okay. Well, what I wanted to say is these are the violations for the breeders that supplied puppies for the coalition of responsible pet store owners. The problem now is they keep saying over and over again that they're highly regulated. Here's the truth. The state, even if they wanted to regulate where pet store puppies come from, they no longer can because the USDA has removed all breeder inspection reports from their public database. And when we FOIA request an inspection report for a breeder, this is what we get, a fully redacted report. The pet store industry knows this. They just won't tell you that. The, um, uh, the chairman of the New Jersey uh, Assembly uh, Consumer Affairs Committee just recently admitted to us that the state of New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs does not have the resources to regulate this industry. T time. Okay, so thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard, please step forward. Hi. Oh, I have to sign. Sorry, I've been here before, never wrote a thing. Um, my name is Rachel Berry, and I live in Madison on Green Village Road. And um, um, I'm really glad, I was really glad to see that the council um, was taking up this issue. It's one that's personally important to me. Um, I've been a volunteer with various animal rescues for the past 20 years. Um, one of the first things I did when I moved to Madison was find the nearest um, place where I could volunteer and landed at St. Hubert's. Um, and I've been, um, I'm not a representative of them at all, but I've been trying to help in any way I can since I moved here. Um, 
Uh, one thing that really struck me, I'm also a member of the Chamber of Commerce in Madison and really care about our local business and shop local whenever I possibly can. Um, you can go talk to the camera store and find out how much I'm committed to that um, today. <laughs> um, but what I want to say is um, I, I don't think Madison's local pet shops are competing against Chewy on pet sales because Chewy.com doesn't sell animals. Um, they, they should be focused on customer service, which they are, <laughs> um, and providing people with um, products they need in association with their pets. I, I do not think it is ruinous to a business to take away this part of the business. And there is so much abuse, and the fact that there now isn't federal oversight is chilling. And that's exactly why I think um, responsible communities are taking a look at these a look at these laws and ordinances and, and, and doing what needs to be done to protect animals and consumers. Um, these are sad stories about people adopting a pet and then terrible things happen and they have huge medical expenses. So again, thank you. Um, I know you're tabling it and looking at the language and I've read a lot up on this subject and I just really appreciate that you're taking the time to invest in this when there's so many things um, that we all need to focus on. But thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? You can come up and stand nearby so you can save time. In the Hi, I'm Tammy with North Star Pet Rescue. Uh, we are a foster-based rescue um, based out of Booton, but once again, we're... And that address? Uh, 152 Fairview Ave, Booton. And write okay. it down. I will. <laughs> I can't talk and speak. <laughs> um, so I got involved in rescue with... Um, I actually purchased a dog from a pet store, and she ended up having all kinds of autoimmune diseases and was sick uh, for 15 and a half years of her life. Uh, I'm not saying that that can't happen when you get a rescue dog either, uh, but she did have all kinds of issues. Um, I also purchased two dogs from a breeder before I got involved with rescue, and uh, they too also had all kinds of medical issues. Uh, I don't begrudge anyone from going to a reputable breeder. I don't begrudge anyone from wanting to get a puppy, but it's the where these puppies are coming from and the situation that they are in and purchasing a puppy from one of these puppy stores is supporting these puppy mills. Uh, one of the shelters that we pull from, their euthanasia rate is 90%. They take in 22,000 dogs a year and 90% of those dogs are euthanized. So I just, you know, just my, my take on the, on the situation. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Joanne Ferrer. I'm from Bridgewater, New Jersey. Um, so I do work for a local pet shop, and we do sell puppies. And I want to say that our puppies are of our utmost importance. Um, they're always top priority, number one, um, from the moment they arrive. Even before they arrive, we always make sure that they're all happy, healthy, and thriving. Um, if I see a puppy that needs, like, extra TLC, needs extra, like, um, emotional support, socialization, extra love and kisses, um, playtime, I'm always there. Like whatever they need, I'm 100% always there like for the puppies. And as for breeders, they're amazing. They're like the kindest, most humble people. Um, they're very responsive and they're all, um, their, their facilities are like top of the notch, um, very beautiful, pristine, um, and they're all USDA licensed. Um, so they all have to be federally and state regulated and inspected. Um, so as for our part, we have to make sure that all of our puppies have all of their information um, in our systems and make sure they each and every one of them has a kennel card that displays um, all up to date, 100% accurate information as well. And it's vis visibly displayed like where the puppy is located. Um, and then we also make sure that our UC license book is present in our store as well. And then, um, so I'm also actually a vet tech student, 
and being in this environment, I'm so incredibly thankful every single day. Um, every single day. And just watching like my bosses like hustle day in, day out, 24-7. Um, They're always working. They're always making sure all the puppies are intact. They're all happy and healthy and thriving. Um, and they're all in good care. And they also make sure that all of our customers are, are well accommodated for. They're always very responsive. This is a 24-hour job. Like, there's no time off. There's no hours off. Um, and we're always there for them. And then the most and best part about this job is helping families find their forever and perfect newest family member for them, which is the puppy. And like socializing with the customer and socializing with um, whatever puppy they choose, like finding the right one, that's exactly for them. Um, maybe it's not in our shop, but we're one step closer to helping them find the one. Um, and whenever they do, it's like the best and most heartwarming feeling. Like I smile ear to ear. <laughs> and sometimes I even tear up sometimes, like now. <laughs> and then, um, so yeah, that's like the best part of this job. Um, the puppies are always number one in my heart. And like I'm growing, learning, evolving, falling in love every single day. And I'm helping families do so as well. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Kathy Daly, West End Avenue, Madison. So I've lived in Madison a very long time at this point, 20 something years, and I don't think I've ever, uh, we have had pet stores in Madison, I know we have two pet stores now. I don't think I've ever seen a dog or cat for sale at one of our pet stores. So I'm kind of, I'm just sitting here in the audience very puzzled as to what initiated the need for this particular uh, for this particular ordinance. Um, and I'm hoping that as you discuss it, even if, I know you're going to be tabling it, but even if you can just give some sort of inkling as to what initiated the need for this, is there a pet, is, are one of our pet stores intending to uh, sell pets, to, to sell um, cats and dogs? Uh, if so, that would be, you know, that would make it more relevant. But at this point, it's seeming like it's, it's relevant for, um, for the, the borough of Madison. Um, and then I'm, I'm just going to say it as, as an aside, um, and I don't even know how it really will fit into this, your, your deliberations about this, but I have, um, my husband and I have had dogs for the last 20 something years, and both of them were adopted, and uh, they both had, uh, had some issues. And the, the dog that we have now, and we love him dearly, is um, almost nine. And uh, he has very serious behavioral issues. We adopted him when he was just eight weeks old from St. Hubert's. So these things can happen in any kind of situation. And uh, just for what it's worth, that's our, my personal experience with adopted dogs. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Leslie Moran. I'm from Randolph. And, okay. Um, I just want to make two simple brief points um, because I think my colleagues can probably explain in greater detail why the, such an ordinance is a positive thing for the, oh, positive thing for the council to do. Um, First, um, this I've discovered a number of times, it is easy for intelligent and aware individuals to be fooled uh, by the pet shop pitch. Uh, maybe some people have heard of my husband, Tom, who ran for assembly in LD25. And in the course of, I'm sure you also have experienced in the course of uh, political campaigns, you meet a lot of uh, smart, politically savvy people. But those characteristics uh, do not insulate you from making a poor decision with regard to purchasing a puppy. And one of Tom's uh, close associates, who I will leave nameless here, uh, purchased a puppy from Vinnie Lasacco, um, and that's uh, the notorious owner of Just Pups in East Hanover, which was closed by their health department. Um, and he had no idea. It was a classic scenario where um, it was holiday season, he did the right thing. He went to a breeder and he found out that you can't short order a puppy. Um, and so then he went with instant gratification, uh, not knowing any better. Um, 
and Mr. Lasacco made a sale. Um, the second point um, is that your beautiful town, where I actually used to live on Wilmer Street, um, has something in common with my town now of Randolph, and that is you are home to well-respected rescues as we are. Um, and I'm happy to have uh, Claudine Chung with me tonight, who's the president of the Friends of the Randolph Animal Pound. And um, we are regional um, shelter, uh, just as St. Hubert's. I mean, we're many differences between the two, but we um, do animal control for five different towns. And um, I really I have little more to say other than we have many uh, volunteers in our town, as I'm sure you do as well, because St. Hubert's is such a well-respected rescue. And uh, I want to mention 11th Hour also. They have a kennel down the road from me. Um, so that we know uh, about the origin of the puppies in retail stores, and uh, we, I think we need to be leaders on this issue and not be fearful of passing an ordinance like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michael Glass, and I uh, would like to thank you for welcoming me to your great state. I'm from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania resident. I think I'm the only Pennsylvania here. What, what was the address? Uh, it's uh, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. I have it. I have all, and it, so therefore they all. I use that comment a lot in many different scenarios, and then I slow it down. And I hear that a lot. I have all, and it, so therefore they all. I have a bad situation and it, so therefore they all. I'd like to share with you what may sound conceited. Somebody might say, I don't want to sound conceited, but well, no, I do want to sound conceited when I share this next bit of information with you. But I'd like to share it in the interest of confidence, not conceit. I've been in the, the, uh, the dog industry, the animal ownership industry, the breeding world, the breeding community since I'm this big. I'm 57 years old. I'm in trouble if I have to do anything else. It's all I've ever done. I've been involved in just about every aspect of the industry. I've been in literally hundreds and hundreds of pet stores. I apologize, hundreds and hundreds of breeder facilities, dozens and dozens of pet stores across the country, and uh, also in Puerto Rico. And you're, you're being painted a picture here that just isn't true. And I think it's, it's unfair that, uh, and, and unkind that those uh, like-minded as myself in front of you who can share the history of what I've seen, and I've seen the pendulum change, and I've seen the, the exponential changes in the, in the kennel and dog breeding industry, they were, they were lying to you. They're looking at us in the eyes, and they're standing up in front of you, and in so many words, they're going, it's a lie. They're pointing to me and saying, it's a lie. And that's, that's really a shame. The other exponential change I've seen for, for some of you that may be my age uh, is, is the HSUS exponential change. Uh, many of you uh, know them from when we were little, when we were kids. They were the good guys. They were the guys that went out there and they saved the pets. They were the dog catchers. And, and we respected them and we cherished them. And there's been an exponential change in that industry also. Unfortunately, it's turned into somewhat of a, a, a political machine. And just as I have visited just, uh, many um, kennels and many pet stores, I've also attended HSUS uh, lobby meetings and HS uh, US uh, 101 days. And it's not a secret. They admit it. Their goal is not to correct the industry. Their goal is to end the industry. Their goal is not to have clean, cared for dogs. Their, dog, their goal is to have no dogs. And when I look at the ordinance as written, uh, which I appreciate uh, that it's been withdrawn and will be rewritten, unfortunately I don't get to go back to Pennsylvania and take credit for that, but thank you. Um, it, it's unfortunate that. Uh, that that uh, has taken place today, that the HSUS has now ha that agenda, and, you, and, and it's very eloquently explained when you go to those meetings, and in one hour, I've witnessed with my own eyes on multiple occasions at these PowerPoint presentations by the HSUS, $100,000 Ivy League education summed up in an hour on how to end the animal industry, and then they very magically and strategically uh, take the good-minded, the goodwill people, the rescues and the shelters and networks that we need, and they use them as the pawns to go out there and end a good industry. There's a middle ground. And we, One minute. Thank you. And we would like to work with you, as, as you stated and appreciate, to, to come to discussions on what would work well for all the residents of your borough, your township. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Cindy Knowles, and I am the owner of a pet shop in uh, White House Station named Fairy Licious. And your, your address? Um, I, I live in Tewksbury. Thank you. Hi. Um, we're only here tonight. These adversaries are going town to town because they lost at the state level. Um, at the state level, you know, they tried to go through too far because there is good regulation on the books. Um, we are not dying, as the HSUS would have you believe. We are thriving. Families want their puppies. They want a safe little puppy for their children. They want, they might have elderly parents in the house. For many reasons, people, non-shedding, may want to seek out a puppy of their own. We encourage people to rescue. If that's for them, um, go at it. But that's not for everybody. We have a St. Hubert's. You could drive five miles from my store, right, in our own community. And we coexist very nicely. Some people will rescue. And there are many who do not want to go that route and should not be forced to go that route. Um, we, they will say otherwise. We, I've been in business nine years. I've never had a local, state, federal health violation or consumer affairs violation. Federal, nothing, not one. They will say otherwise. That's because they think they're investigators, and they go in, and in, they're not investigators. There's, they have no official government authority over us. Um, as far as rescue, I happen to also own an animal hospital with my brother, who's an excellent veterinarian. Um, he tells me all kinds of stories. Now, my adversaries would say he's falsifying my vet records, and I'm selling sick dogs. That's pretty pretty out there, but this is the kind of stuff that they will do. First of all, I don't use my brother for my vet certificates. I use another local vet. I'll use my brother for more long-term and emergency or when I, when I you know, don't have uh, you know, the other vet available. Um, he's been practicing in the state of New Jersey for 30 years with an exemplary record. In fact, he used to go out and inspect animal hospitals and write up for the state consumer board. Um, so these are the kinds of things these people will do. Um, they'll search out people and say, does anybody have a, a puppy that got sick from Furrylicious? Um, well, I guess they found one not too long ago where they thought they found one. I was dragged into court a year after, a year after a, pup, a puppy was sold. Never heard from this customer that there was any problems. Turned out these people behind me were behind that. And uh, with a little back and forth with what this is all about, the judge dismissed it without merit, frivolous and without merit. It, One minute. It was ridiculous. Um, there's many problems with the rescues. We had one come into the animal hospital from 11th hour that they just talked about. Um, came in, uh, the, the, our associate vet said, you cannot adopt this kitten now. You have to quarantine this kitten. Um, four days later, the family, unbeknownst that the 11th hour rescue had just been into the hospital with that cat, a family came in with that rat, what was thought to be a rabbit cat. Four days, they were told to go in quarantine. So these rescues are unregulated. They talk about how we're not regulated. They can't get the USDA compliant. We have them. We're stakeholders. We deal with our breeders. We know our breeders. Here are unredacted. Speak to the speak to the council, please. Unredacted USDA inspection reports. I have this for every one of our USDA compliant breeder that comes into my store. So they may not be able to get them, and the reason they can't is because the USDA had to take them down to protect uh, time. the privacy of the breeders. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Plenty of regulation. I'm Liz Willette from. <laughs> Is there a pen there still? Um, here, I'll grab one. Oh, thank you.
So my name is Liz Willette. I'm right on Myrtle Ave in Madison. Um, I've worked in rescue for a very long time in four different states. I've worked with fosters and um, a lot of dog training, including um, aggressive dog rehabilitation for many years. Um, I've actually helped bust a puppy mill in North Carolina back in 2007. So I've seen firsthand um, how awful they are and also how they fuel pet stores. Um, I've been the one to pay vet bills for medical issues puppies have had due to the many fake vet records that are running rampant and the basic and, and horrid animal cruelty that they've endured. Um, further, I've, I've seen AKC registered and inspected champion breeders in several states with puppies living in absolute filth. Despite recent inspections, I've seen well-bred dogs show serious aggression, anxiety, and worse. And as soon as you have people shopping for a dog based on anticipated behavioral traits that will just magically appear because of their breed, you're putting your family at risk, you're putting the town at risk, you're putting yourself at risk. Um, when you have dog owners that, that have dogs as objects, you, you're going to see behavioral issues. Doesn't matter what the breed is, doesn't matter what breeder they came from. Um, we actually have three rescues, um, all of whom come from rough, rough paths, and our focus is training. And they are so well behaved and trained that people constantly ask me if they are service dogs when we're out in town. Right, so the point being that like it's not the dog, right? The, all purebreds aren't bad, all rescues aren't bad. It's it's the animal cruelty, right? That's seen in the puppy mills, in the kennels, in the retail dog stores, right? And and I believe very strongly that it's wrong to turn a blind eye to this, um, to turn a blind eye to the the animal cruelty, and solely allow that to happen just so people have a choice to buy a dog that looks a certain way. And I, I really think we have a duty to ask ourselves at what cost, right? Having that choice is nice, but, but at what cost? Thank you. Thank you. Paper. Hello, my name is Greg Maines. I also live on Myrtle Avenue. Um, I have had experience with both bred dogs from the AKC, certified breeders. I've also had a number of rescues. Um, I've experienced health issues with both sources. Um, I've also had perfectly healthy dogs from both sources. Um, what resounds most with me is attributing a dog's behavioral tendencies to the source of the dog. Um, in my opinion, in my experience, it's more reflective of the owner, uh, the, the, how the dog behaves itself. I personally adopted a three-year-old <clears throat> dog, a rescue dog with anxiety. I spent a lot of money and a lot of time, and I watched her evolve into a well-balanced, calm dog that I would trust with anyone's kids, anyone's cats, anyone's family. Um, my best friend, on the other hand, bought a, a schnauzer from a breeder in Pennsylvania uh, that was purchased under the uh, pretense of being a calm, well-behaved dog. I've watched this dog devolve into an aggressive, anxious dog. Um, as soon as he hands me the leash, the dog is completely calm. We can walk past dogs without him paying any mind. Uh, whereas my friend, unfortunately, um, lets him at the end of the leash. The dog lunges at other dogs, gets nervous around other people because he's protective of his owner because the proper structure wasn't laid down for the dog. Um, so. To me, the argument from breeders that they produce more well-rounded dogs is a moot point because I've seen it go both ways, uh, and I think that it's irresponsible to use that as a marketing ploy to sell dogs when there are plenty of dogs with the right structure, right exercise, and right time devoted can be wonderful dogs, and they're being put down because they're competing with these so-called super dogs from breeders. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Dave Fisher. I live in Manasquan, New Jersey, and I've worked with advocacy groups, uh, as well as um, we fostered for uh, several rescues uh, for many years. Um, I just wanted, I wasn't planning on getting up tonight, but I wanted to respond to a few of the speakers that raised some questions earlier. 
uh, mainly to do with um, why pass the ordinance or why consider an ordinance. Um, about 130 other towns have adopted the, essentially the same ordinance in New Jersey as a preemptive measure, uh, not because they're trying to get rid of a pet store, but because they would like to have an ordinance in place that would prevent a pet store that sells puppies and, and or kittens uh, from mass breeders. And uh, essentially, in my opinion, the vast majority of all pet stores purchase from mass commercial breeders, um, what we refer to as puppy mills. So that's why I think most towns have adopted uh, the same ordinance that you're considering tonight. Um, pet stores that don't sell puppies, uh, fine. And, and those are great, uh, great um, merchandisers and, and stores that support um, the pet industry. Uh, East Hanover, who shut down Just Pups, had to spend $90,000 in legal fees to get rid of that store because of all the problems it caused and because of the lawsuits that ensued. So that's something you, you may avoid, you know, should a pet store open up in Madison um, if you don't have an ordinance in place. And essentially what I, you know, would like to say is, is you know, since all pet stores or nearly all pet stores, as far as the research shows, purchase from mass breeders, and these mass commercial breeding facilities are obviously not healthy environments in which to raise puppies, um, having hundreds of dogs uh, literally on top of each other in cages. Um, and, uh, and, and if you can get inspection reports for the uh, facilities, um, I guess Ms. Knowles has hers because she's the owner, but a town can't get them, we can't get them, uh, and the state of New Jersey can't even access those, those records. So um, we participated in the Morristown hearing also, and I was at that hearing when uh, the ordinance was considered, and Councilwoman Deeb indicated that uh, the council didn't adopt it, but um, Councilman Armington was prepared to adopt it, uh, and other council members were too, but Councilwoman Deeb had issues with some of the whereas clauses and decided to change her mind about the own, own ordinance that she introduced. Um, why, I'm not sure. So. Um, in, in summary, I think I would encourage this council to seriously consider adopting this ordinance like so many other towns have and uh, prevent what could end up being a real problem for the town of Madison if a store does open up. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Nora Parker from St. Hubert's Animal Welfare Center. And uh, as the agency contracted to provide your animal control and rescue services, we applaud you. for. And, and your, your address, please. 575 Woodland Avenue, Madison. Um, and we applaud you for introducing it. Um, just a few quick points. Um, you do have some great pet stores in Madison. We work with them. Pet Value, long ago, signed the pledge not to sell puppies and kittens. We would also like to make it clear that our major problem with the puppies in these stores is the source of the puppies. I don't for one minute question the young lady who said how well she cares for those puppies in that store every day, falls in love every day, because I would too. Uh, we all do. It's the source of the puppies. The puppies in those stores are the lucky ones because they got out. The dogs that are producing those puppies never know the warmth of human touch. They are not well cared for. They don't have enrichment. They don't, some of them ever see the light of day. Um, and when they don't produce anymore, they're out. They're discarded. Um, and I know what their life can be after that if they live because I owned one. Um, that was a breeding dog from a puppy mill and it would break your heart. So um, I think that it is the source of the dogs that really bothers us and I understand hearing that you have reports but until you've seen and you've seen the treatment of the dogs we don't necessarily put a large amount of um, faith in those reports and so I think that's the main issue. It's not the issue of whether a sick dog came from Cindy's store, a sick dog came from a shelter because they're living beings, so we're not, that could happen to any of us. Um, so we're not here to go tit for tat on who had a sick dog or who didn't. They're living beings. Um, these puppy mills are not only in the Midwest or in Pennsylvania. We were called on recently to help remove 100 dogs right here in New Jersey 
from a, a puppy mill that was operating right here in our state and the conditions are not good. Uh, we're not here to say that Cindy or anybody else's store isn't clean, that they're not loving on those puppies that are out of that situation, but we have an intense problem with the source of those puppies. And the way to stop that, um, the gentleman before me spoke about closing down the East Hanover store and what it cost. And um, that particular um, store, because he was going to himself to pick up the dogs he sourced, cost us as well when it was late at night and there was no heat in those trucks and those puppies were left alone in them. Present company excluded. I've never heard that about any of these stores, but we had to go out late at night and get them out of those trucks where they were left. So I think that with some wording changes, a reputable breeder that some of the people talked about earlier, their dogs are never going to be sold over the internet. They're never going to be sold well, one minute or ever. So I think that um, the, the main reason that we want to see the stores not selling is the source of those puppies that they're selling. High priced puppies, crossbred and mixed breed puppies marketed as designer breeds for $3,500 when they're simply mixed breed dogs. Um, and it's the source of those dogs. We can't say enough knowing what's inside of those puppy mills. Is like. The puppies in the stores are the lucky ones because they got out. Thanks. Thank you. My name is um, Jessica Montori and I live on Ridge Road in White House Station. So I have been the puppy care and sales manager at Furrylicious for the last several years now. I'm responsible for not only vetting the breeders on a professional level, but also on a personal level. Um, these are hardworking breeders and their families take on these babies 24-7, 365. Um, I FaceTime with them, I, they send me pictures all the time. Their dogs are a part of their families. They're not these dogs that are held up in wire crates all day, every day. Um, there was a video sent to you guys. That's only, you know, a piece of what these breeders, you know, what they're about. I mean, I have pictures and pictures I would be, like, love to email you guys. Um, now, when the puppies go home, we're in constant contact with those families. Um, if anything comes up at all, they contact us 24 hours a day, whenever. We're always on top of it. Um, I actually get, you know, milestone pictures, like puppy's first birthday or six months in, and I get to see how the puppies grow with their families. If there is an issue, we handle it. We don't ever want a puppy going into an environment that, you know, they're not thriving in, which is why we stay on top of them and we are very, very careful about our breeders. Um, you know, there is good and bad in everything, but that's why we vet everybody so thoroughly. You know, our inspection reports aren't just available to us, they're available to inspectors, which is why when they come in, they want to see everything. They want to see our book. They want to see our records for the past, you know, two years back. They want to see a puppy paperwork contract so they can then match those up with not only the breeders but the people that the puppy went home with so they can match everything up. There's a paper trail for everything and that's regulation and that's why it's important that everyone is regulated like they are. Um, it's really hard to be vilified all the time for you know what we do knowing you know our end of it and also having such a good relationship with the breeders as I do. Um, they're very responsive, like I said, we're in touch with them all the time. I see the puppy's parents. They're responsive to our customers. If they want to see the dog's parents, if they have questions, they are readily available. Um, as for the inspection reports, like I said, you know, our inspectors and any officials, they have full access to them. Um, they just don't want them readily available because people are abusing them. And that's, you know, the truth of it. 
we work really hard, you know. We love these babies like they're our own. And I just think it's important that everybody can choose where they come from. And it's not, you know. One minute. It's not perceived of as a bad thing because you want to get a puppy from us rather than a rescue. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Larry Cohen, I live in Fanwood, New Jersey. I'm here as a volunteer representative of the Humane Society of the United States. Um, I'd like to follow up on what Nora said and remind you that this is, this is not an anecdotal issue. This is a societal I issue. This is an issue where you're going to decide what kind of town Madison is. This is something that is nationwide. Over 300 towns and cities have passed this ordinance. There has to be a reason for it. Two states have passed laws prohibiting this business model. There has to be a reason for it. Ironically, in every single place where this occurs and, and ordinance or state law gets passed, not one pet store ever, ever says that they source from a puppy mill. So I think you need to ask yourself some really hard questions, and you need to do research. You need to say to yourself, okay, if a pet store never, ever gets a dog from a puppy mill, where are all those dogs going? They're not all going one at a time out on the internet. These, are not, these breeders are not mini Amazon.coms. That's not the distribution network. There are brokers who go from breeder to breeder and load up trucks, scores and scores of dogs, and they deliver them to pet stores. You need to understand what these breeders, what law these breeders live under, the Animal Welfare Act. Look it up. You can see what's allowed. You need to understand what New Jersey state law says about these stores, that they have to be held accountable for the breeders that they use inspection reports. And you know that they are unavailable. You can't get them. So if you were to allow a pet store to come into Madison, you might as well allow your restaurants to inspect themselves and say, hey, take our word for it. We're good. Don't worry. Everything's OK in here. You can't really find out, but take our word for it. You have in your code, as, as a way of being responsible for your citizens, you have a regulation that says that landscapers cannot start work before 8 a.m. Small, maybe insignificant, but you did that, or your predecessors did that, to protect your citizens. That's your job, is to protect your citizens. That's why you've taken away cigarette vending machines from restaurants. That's why you limit alcohol distribution at a certain point every night. You protect your citizens. You weigh public safety versus business interests, and sometimes you have to inter intervene to protect your citizens. That's what this is. This is an issue of protecting your citizens, not to mention one minute. protecting a species that we have brought into our homes that serve on police forces in the military, help children read, help the disabled, I mean, what do they deserve in return from us? They cannot speak for themselves. They suffer terribly in these mills. And I think the bottom line is you have to decide, do you want to be part of that or not? Do you want Madison to be that town that says, you know what, we'll roll the dice and we'll see if a store comes in and we'll, we'll try and figure out some way to regulate them. I don't know how. Or you can say, you know what, this is a business model that that's, it's not for us. This is not our values. Stores can do just fine, and they do, selling all kinds of supplies and services. May I give the clerk time. some research? You can give the clerk that. Yep. Thank you. We'll uh, close the hearing. 
Oh. Okay. All right. I have to go to the Good evening. My name is Barbara Wrighton. I live in Long Valley. Um, I'm here tonight not to argue either of these sides necessarily, but to give you a different perspective that I don't think you're aware of. Um, one of my jobs as a volunteer with the National Animal Interest Alliance is I'm their shelter data manager. I collect animal intake and disposition numbers from shelters and rescues all across the country. It's the largest free searchable database of its kind available for the public lawmakers, anybody who's curious about what's going on in their state. I have data from the state of New Jersey. Unfortunately, it's not complete. Um, the only responders to the, to the questionnaire are about 100 licensed shelters that are within the state. If you were to go on PetFinder and do a search just for the state of New Jersey, you would find over 400 rescues <clears throat> that are operating in the state, and so we really don't know exactly what's going on in there. Um, much has been made of the sourcing, and I can tell you from the data that I could get from the, from the Department of Health. In 2017, the state imported 9,902 dogs that we know of. Um, one of the organizations that I have discovered that does not report to the state bragged that they had brought in over 16,000 dogs in four years. Um, so we're not talking about New Jersey dogs that are going to end up in our rescues. Most of them are coming from out of state. And so that's where the problem of the sourcing becomes because now we really don't know where they came from. Um, there was a passing reference, I'm not going to belabor any of the language from the withdrawn um, ordinance, but there was a passing reference to um, the problems of financing public shelters. And I can tell you that rescues um, don't get public financing, they get through donations or grants. So the rescues that are importing all these dogs are not creating a burden for the state other than, and this was the second point that I noticed in your, where, in your findings, there was a sort of a, a hint that this was going to benefit um, public health. And unfortunately, in the past several years, our country is having a really big problem with, get that in a minute, um, not only are people importing from other states outside of the state, but they're importing from other countries as well. And I have here for you, I'll leave these with you or I can email them if you'd like. Um, in December of 2018, there was a mega pet adoption event in Delaware that ended up... One, one minute. I'm oh, sure. 1,200 uh, 1, animals, 800 dogs, 400 cats. They came, they bought, they dispersed, and the dogs broke out in Carvo spreading it all over the country. We have, in, in 2015, rabies was imported from Egypt on a falsified rabies certificate. We have Cornell University in March of 2019 is talking about a new strain of canine distemper that arrived from Korea that our dogs and our wildlife have no natural immunity to. And there is no vaccine for it. In 2015, the canine influenza of a strain that originated in Korea broke out in Chicago and again spread throughout the country. This is an unregulated system, and it's time that that changed. Time. Thank you very much. Can I give you these? To the clerk. Thank you. My business card is on here. Um, I cut myself very short. I'd be happy to work with you, give you a bigger perspective than you have already. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
council members. Um, Speak in the microphone, please. Oh, yeah. I don't have my glasses, so please, if I go like this. <laughs> the pet stores will tell you that they get their dogs from, that they don't get their dogs from puppy mills. Did you state your name and address? Oh, I did not. Catherine Neese, Bud Lake, New Jersey. That's what they said 129 times in New Jersey before towns and cities passed their ordinances. And that's what they've said in California and Maryland before they passed the state laws. So we have all these puppy mills, but no pet store anywhere is buying from any of these puppy mills. Yet these mills somehow manage to stay in business. The truth is the pet store argument is a ruse. They claim their breeders can't be puppy, puppy mills because they're licensed by the USDA. But this is nonsense. A puppy mill is a descriptive, not a legal term. Even the USDA admits its license is not a seal of approval. It's just permission to operate. Consider these quotes taken directly from USDA inspection reports of breeders that have done business in New Jersey. In the outdoor enclosure containing 18 dogs, there were seven with open wounds on the tops of their ears from flies biting them. There were three Shiba Inus heavily infested with ticks, external parasites. The ticks were observed to be concentrated on the face, ears, and in between the toes of their feet. At least six of the indoor enclosures containing at least 10 dogs have a buildup of feces in them. The inspector observed that the feet of two white dogs were soiled with a brown material. A 10-year-old Pomeranian was observed excessively salivating. Closer observation revealed the animal did not have any teeth, and the jawbone on the left side was partially missing and detached from the gums, which left bone exposed. And there were no health records available. One facility had listed in the program of veterinary care the routine method of euthanasia as gunshot in the brain at close range. And I believe there is um, a pet shop here this evening that has purchased from that breeder. These are just the tip of the iceberg. There's scores more. The line between large commercial breeders in the Midwest that treat their dogs like livestock and deserve no description other than puppy mills and New Jersey's pet store are clear as day and straight as an arrow. Pet supplies and services is a multi-billion dollar industry. Pet stores can and do thrive without having to sell dogs. 24 of the top 25 pet store chains in the US do not sell dogs. 96% of AKC member breed clubs say they will not sell their puppies to pet stores. The New Jersey Federation of Dog of dog clubs warns people not to buy puppies from pet stores. One minute. This is not about regulation or choice. This is about cruelty and taking local action because federal and state agencies have failed miserably at preventing it. No one wants to see Madison go through what East Hanover went through. So now, while there is no store in town, is the time to take this common sense proactive measure. Protect your constituents and do what you can for the thousands of suffering animals, join the multiple other towns that refuse to allow an industry within its borders that profits off of cruelty to these innocent animals. I'm also an uh, owner of a previous uh, puppy milk dog that was at five years old destined to be euthanized because she could no longer produce puppies. Uh, she's an emotional wreck and, and she is a product of her source. Time. Thank you. Uh, hi, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Jeff Morton. I am uh, Odom President of Shaker Pool Pet Stores here in New Jersey. Um, I would arguably be the largest stakeholder uh, in the state. So uh, thank you for letting me speak uh, to this ordinance. Address? Uh, Union, New Jersey. Um, I've heard a lot of, a lot of big stories here today. Um, trying to pass an ordinance where there's uh, no real concern here for the town of Madison, because you don't have a pet store that sells puppies. So why do they approach you? 
one of the residents says, why are we even discussing this? We don't even have a pet store. And one of the motivations that animal activists try and use to uh, bring this before the council is fear and scare tactics. I heard mentioned tonight pet leasing. None of the members of the uh, Responsible Coalition of Pet Store Owners uh, that we belong to, and there are several owners here tonight, do pet leasing. We have publicly opposed pet leasing, but yet they mention it here to scare you. That they're taking advantage of people. We don't do pet leasing, period, end of story. But they mention it to put that fear into you. They bring up USDA, USDA reports. They say, you can't get those reports. Uh, as members of the government, uh, you can get those reports. You can also get them by walking in our front door and saying, hey, can I see your USDA report? And we show it to you. Easy, clean, no bait and switch, no redacted reports, true, clean, honest, up-to-date reports. I heard the Division of Consumer Affairs is fully overwhelmed and doesn't have the manpower to inspect 18 pet stores. Not true. Uh, all the members of our coalition are inspected very regularly because this is a very high profile uh, topic that we're on. Our local health departments inspect us. The Division of Consumer Affairs certainly has the manpower to uh, come by and uh, has visited us, all of us, pet stores in this room, within the last uh, six months, if not a year, for all, all of us. They have the manpower and they, uh, and they certainly exercise it. There's also the uh, uh, animal welfare uh, division of the New Jersey Department of Public Health that also has inspection authority. So saying that uh, government officials are, their hands are tied and they can't inspect us, that's once again a scare tactic. How about fear of lawsuits? How about that? We don't want that, right? If I decide to come into the town of Madison, and I want to open up a pet store here. What's the first thing I have to do? Well, I have to go borrow $800,000, a million bucks, because that's what it costs to build a state-of-the-art facility. Do you think I'm going to risk, risk my, uh, my life, my career, my family, my reputation, so I can smuggle in some illegal pet from a crappy breeder? Uh, no, I would never do that. It, it doesn't make any sense that uh, a businessman would uh, behave in that manner. So I open up in Madison. I employ 30 people. One, one minute. I already have an 8,000 square foot facility, so I might build a 12,000 square foot facility. And what's the first thing that's going to happen? Here comes your Department of Health. According to the activists, your Department of Health can inspect me. Uh, I'm sure he can. He inspects restaurants, inspects hospitals, child care facilities. I'm sure he can come in and inspect my facilities. Town Council can walk in the front door. We're open seven days a week. Would you like to see my reports? Here they are. Easy. Not redacted, not hidden. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and I'd certainly like to be uh, able to participate in any further discussions uh, on your ordinance. Thank you for tabling this. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Linda Hartheimer, and I'm from Parsippany, New Jersey. I have a unique perspective. I'm not only a professional dog trainer with a number of clients in your community who have bought and adopted dogs from all kinds of breeders, from pet stores, and from many different rescues within the state, and dogs that were brought in from elsewhere. I'm also a hobby breeder. I've been involved with dog shows and breeding dogs for over 20 years. I'm an AKC breeder of merit. I'm in charge of public education for my national breed club, as well as the former legislative liaison that work with the AKC. So this is not my first rodeo. I've seen this happening in towns for the past 10 to 15 years with HSUS trying to come in to change the laws in towns where these are not issues and trying to convince intelligent people 
with emotional rationale of why they should change the laws for whatever they are. I'm not anti-rescue. I volunteer for the local Weimar on a rescue as well. So again, I offer a very unique perspective. As a hobby breeder, I know firsthand there are not enough dogs bred by hobby breeders or what you would call responsible breeders for the demand. Rescues do not offer the choice of puppies that as a citizen of this country, we should have a choice of what kind of dog we want for our family. I refer many people to local rescues. However, I've also seen dogs that have been brought up from the South without proper temperament testing because rescues do not have any scrutiny that are not only sick, but have severe temperament issues that have growled and bitten at their children. Now, I'm not saying that dogs from responsible breeders can have issues, but what I'm saying is that there is no way that the people deserve to be told who they can buy dogs from. And again, I have a very unique perspective because I have clients that live in your town as well as Morris County and all over North Jersey who have adopted dogs from all of these sources. And the number of dogs that I see that come from both rescue, pet stores, as well as hobby breeders, you don't see all these illnesses from one particular source. I'm not seeing a huge amount of sick puppies from, say, pet stores. I'm not seeing temperament issues from these dogs. I'm seeing them from many different sources. Again, I firmly believe that people should have the right to choose where one, they get the dogs from and what breed of dog they want to get. And if you walk into a shelter, there's no guarantee or a rescue that they will have the breed of your choice and a puppy, because most rescues don't have puppies of specific breeds. Thank you very much. Thank you. We close the hearing. May I have a motion to withdraw the Ordinance 11? Mayor, I move to withdraw Ordinance 11-2019. A second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. This is on this is on a withdraw. So a yes vote is to withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> she, I didn't hear you call my name. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Is there ordinance eleven withdrawn? Ordinance twelve, two thousand nineteen. Ordinance of the borough of Madison amending Chapter 190 of the Madison Borough Code entitled Water to update the water connection fee schedule. I open the hearing for Ordinance 12. Anyone wishing to comment on or Ordinance 12, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 12-2019. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Mrs. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. I declare Ordinance 12, 2019 adopted and finally passed. And I ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. Ordinance 13 2019. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 155 of the Madison Borough Code entitled Sewer to update the sewer connection fee schedule. I open the hearing for Ordinance 13. Anyone who wish to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 13-2019. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Mrs. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. I declare Ordinance 13-2019 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish not notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. And now we're on to our second invitation for discussion on any topic. Again, Come up, state your name, your address, write the same on the clipboard, and keep your comments to three minutes if you can with a one-minute grace period. Anyone wishing to comment? <laughs> Seeing none, I close the this section. For now, introduction ordinances. Will the clerk please read the statement? The 
ordinance scheduled for first reading has a hearing date set for April the 22nd, 2019. Oh. Uh, are we? Wait, actually, we have no one. Right. Sorry, <laughs> table lost track. Table <laughs> there is no ordinances for introduction. Sometimes I get an automatic pilot. Will the clerk please read the uh, statement related to the consent agenda resolutions? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move a consent agenda resolutions R118 through R131. A second. Any discussion or any that need to be pulled? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Mrs. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. If there is no unfinished business. Approval of vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher register? Current fund, $412,015.22. General capital fund, $23,550. Oh, no Electric there. operating fund, $150,562. Excuse me. Electric operating fund is $150,572.10. Water operating fund is $1,319.37. Water capital fund $204,996.40. The trust $16,879.60. Total is $809,332.69. Mayor, I move approval of the vouchers. A second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Fern? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. There is no new business. Mayor, I move that we adjourn the meeting. I have a second. Heartily second that motion. Yes. All in favor? Early. Aye. All right. The Yankees lost. No, don't. don't oh, I'm that. sorry. You're don't digging tell me that. that. <laughs> Why did you do that? Oh, Maureen, come Wait. on. Okay. Maureen. Right. Jesus. So, Sean, to make up for that. Maureen, what's the score? No. No, I'm not. No, no. Oh, I'm Maureen. sorry. I can't believe you did that. Is UVA winning? Uh, yes, I believe they are. They're at the half. The last. I three did not. Okay. Yeah. Oh. No. Whoa. Oh, God.